Welcome everyone, thanks for coming in. We're so excited for the program tonight. My name is Karen Bloom and I'm the Director of Engagement for Middleton Place Foundation. And um, from a standpoint of logistics, this is a Zoom webinar that you are participating in, which means that you should be able to see the panelists on your screen and hear them when they speak. Um, but there are no video or microphone capabilities for our attendees. So we encourage you to use the functions down at the bottom of your webinar screen. So if you hover your mouse at the bottom of your Zoom webinar screen, you will see some options, including Q and A. If you have some questions for Dr. Miles, uh, I encourage you to click Q&A and type your question there. If you have other comments or congratulations or um, anything else you'd like to offer to any of the panelists and to Dr. Miles, you can do that through the chat window. You can just click on the chat and type your message there. In the chat window, there's a drop down menu and it will show you all panelists um, or it will show you individual panelists that you can message. Um, just please be aware that if you are directly messaging Dr. Miles, she's probably not going to be looking at it during the presentation. Um, so please ask your questions in the Q&A window so that we can feed it to her um, in the Q&A section of the presentation. So welcome everybody. Thanks for being here. And um, if you are on a mobile device with Zoom, you still have the chat and the Q&A functions, but depending on whether you are on an iPad or uh, an Apple iPhone or an Android phone, um, those functions will be in different places. So I encourage you to swipe around or click around on your screen um, to find those functions. I would be here all night talking about them if I went through every different device. So um, <laughs> good luck. And I am going to pass it over to Tracy Todd, who is the president and CEO of Middleton Place Foundation. Thanks again for being here. All right, thank you, Karen. I appreciate your logistical beginning here. We are so excited about this evening and uh, really pleased uh, that Middleton Place Foundation has some great partners tonight uh, that help bring this uh, amazingly large audience, which is a great audience for us tonight. And I, I just wanna thank our partners, the International African American uh, Museum, as well as the Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology at, at uh, Harvard. I'm glad to have those partners with Middleton Place Foundation tonight. Um, this is an exciting occasion because um, at Middleton Place, we've been really anticipating uh, this book for, uh, for, for a while now, but we've been, we, we just continually remind ourselves that book, books take time to write. So we all have to have patience and wait, uh, but we have been patiently waiting on, uh, on Dr. Taya Miles to, uh, to complete this book. So we are so excited about it. And it's the subject matter, Ashley Sack, is something that's really dear to us at Middleton Place. It came to be a part of the collection um, in 2007. It was uh, very miraculously found um, in, uh, in, uh, in a flea market, you might say. And, and I don't wanna to get too, too much into details of that because that's what um, Ty is gonna be talking about. But just to let you know that uh, through the years, it was a real magnet. I mean, it, it caused a lot of attention wherever it was, whether it's at the Middleton Place House Museum, uh, it went to the New York Antique Show uh, and caused quite a stir. Uh, it was a little bittersweet for us at Middleton Place um, to, to let it go away to the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I say bittersweet because we, we didn't, we, we cherish it so much, but we knew it needed to be in front of a larger audience. Um, and I'll just, just the recent history is, the, is it has come back to Middleton Place. It's for conservation purposes in the archives at Middleton Place resting, but we are very excited about our new partnership with the International African American uh, Museum in Charleston uh, and our curators are working together on how it will be displayed on long term loan there uh, in downtown Charleston at the new museum when it opens in, two, in 2022. So exciting news there. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Ty, Dr. Taya Miles. Um, she is a professor of history, a Radcliffe alumna professor at the Radcliffe Institute for 
Advanced Study and the director of the Charles Warren Center for, study, for Studies in American History at Harvard University. She's an award-winning author, so you can only imagine the anticipation we've had for years as we waited on Taya to, to finish uh, this book, the subject tonight, All That She Carried, The Journey of Ashley Sack, A Black Family Keepsake. Uh, Taya, thank you very much, and I'd like to give you the floor. Thank you, Tracy. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm so happy to be here with you, and I've been noticing your messages come across uh, the chat, your, your greetings and uh, your statements of where you are uh, zooming in from. It's really wonderful to have such a wide audience from so many different places in the country. And it's wonderful to, um, to be virtually at Middleton Place and virtually in Charleston for this event. I am very grateful for the chance to be here this evening with everyone who is here I am very grateful for the collaboration that had to take place for this event to be organized. Karen Blue has been a, a warm and um, informative host for this event. And in addition, she is wearing the most uplifting necklace that I have probably ever seen. If you didn't notice it before, when she comes back on, look for her rainbow necklace, which is a perfect fit for Pride Month. And I want to also thank Joshua Parks, who I know is equally responsible for helping many more people to know about this event. And we're helping everybody to find the links and to be here tonight. I have to also thank Mary Edna Sullivan and Jeff Neal, two staff members, curators, interpreters at Middleton Place, who have been supportive from the very beginning of this project. And I wanna to say too, also by way of preamble or introduction, that the subject of slavery is a difficult <laughs> subject. I mean, right now there are a number of heated debates and contests going on around the country about how it is that slavery should be taught, whether or not slavery should be taught, how it is that race should be addressed and reckoned with in educational spaces. And I will say that the staff members at Middleton Place Foundation and at the site have been open to me and other researchers for years and from the very beginning of these projects. There have been a number of people who have been looking at Ashley Sack, including the anthropologist Mark Alexander, who did the first work to trace the origins of the Sack, including the historian Heather Williams, who focused on the sack as an example of uh, enslaved families who were separated and who desperately tried to find one another again. And across the time span that people have worked on these projects, and even prior to that, Middleton Place stewards have been open. They have not attempted to shut down conversation. They have not attempted to hide from the past and I will say with regard to my book in particular, there are some moments in my book where um, I try to be direct about the various complexities and the various dynamics that existed in the past, in the lives of enslaved people, in their relationships with those who legally owned them, in a series of actions and in a system that was deeply immoral. And also in the present, when it comes to commemoration, memorialization, institutions, interpretation, and museums. And even though staff members at Middleton Place had a copy of my manuscript in advance, they did not try to shut down any of the debate or any of the critique that I include in my book. I think this is a really important way for us to interact as people who are trying to understand a very complex, very difficult, very painful history, and who by necessity must do it together. Because we are all here together right now in this moment in time, 
um, trying to live into individual lives, trying to live healthy family lives, trying to build and care for communities, and, and trying to exist in uh, a national context that is quite fraught. So I'm grateful to everyone who has supported my research and the research of others uh, with regard to the SAC and uh, all the questions that we need to delve deeply into with regard to the very trying and often upsetting past of this country. So what I'd like to do in uh, the hour that we have together is to talk about how it is that I came to work on this project, offer a bit of an overview on the project, talk about Ashley Sack a little bit to orient us, and then go into an excerpt from my book, All That She Carried. And the excerpt will focus on dress and clothing, which was a very important aspect of the Sachs history. I am going to share my screen now so that I can move through just a few images as I speak. And I've got you spotlighted, Dr. Miles, but it sounds like that's not coming through for some folks, so I apologize for interrupting. If you all look at the top right-hand corner of your screen and hover your mouse, there should be an option for speaker view or gallery view. Please make sure you are in speaker view, and I'm hoping that that will allow you to see this screen share in full screen. Um, Dr. Miles is spotlighted. Um, so definitely feel free to drop me some info in the chat um, to let me know that that is happening for us. Um, hopefully that fixed it. Okay, thanks. Are you getting notes in the chat that everything is okay, Karen? Okay. So um, I'm going to offer an overview now and then go into a little bit of um, a reading from the book and then stop in time so that we can uh, first hear Dr. Bernard Powers' uh, question and move into his facilitation of our discussion. So as I said, my focus tonight is going to be on one particular aspect or facet of the book all that she carried. And that's the chapter that looks at the tattered dress. So some background on how it is that I came to this project. Um, this is a case of the best laid plans that must be uh, dismantled in order to make room for uh, more, more important, uh, more urgent work. I did not expect to write a book about Ashley Sack. I didn't expect to write another book uh, at this moment about the Southeast. I had actually been planning to write a next book on uh, the US West, on uh, Blacks in the American West and Black and Indigenous relationships in the West. And much of my research and much of my um, writing up to this point has been on slavery and enslavement in the context of African American and Native American overlapping and intertwined histories. So my plan had been to take my previous project, which had been on slavery in the Midwest, both Black and Native enslavement, and uh, just keep on moving West and look at Black and Native lives, experiences, legacies of enslavement, legacies of land loss in uh, the Rocky Mountain region. But that all changed when I attended a conference which was held in Savannah. It was a conference on the histories and the environments of the coastal Southeast. And I was there because I had recently published a book about haunted plantations and haunted manor homes in the South. And um, one of the stories that I looked at for that book was situated at Dunbar Creek on St. Simon's Island, a place that is said to be haunted uh, because in the 1830s, a slave ship was moving through Dunbar Creek carrying a number of Igbo men and they, uh, they capsized the ship, uh, 
everybody on board fell into the water. And these Igbo men were then said to have flown back to Africa. So many of us have heard the story of um, Africans flying home rather than uh, being, being willing uh, to be enslaved. And many of those stories trace back to this particular historical event. So at that environmental history conference, I talked about that story. And afterward, a journalist named Ben Goggins came up to me and asked me if I knew Ashley Seth. I felt incredibly uh, compelled by his insistence that I really needed to see this object. And when I did see it, I realized why he had made the connection between my story about uh, Ebo Landing on St. Simon's Island, about um, the tales of haunting, and Ashley Sack. Because Ashley Sack is the most beautiful and the most haunting artifact of the period of enslavement that I have ever seen, that I have ever experienced, that I have ever interacted with. It is an utterly unique, one of a kind, deeply moving, first-hand account, first-hand expression, poetic rendition of what the experience of slavery was like on the inside, in the internal space, in, in the interior zone of Black women's lives, of Black girls' lives. And what I did uh, finally encounter the sack, I knew that I had to work on it. It's, it's just one of those things that <laughs> it speaks to you in a sense. It, it calls you in a sense. And I, I really appreciate Tracy Todd's um, comments about bringing the sack back for conservation because it needed to rest. Very interesting language. I think in that statement, he suggested that the sack has some kind of life and has some kind of animacy. And I, I felt that too working on this project. And I think many people feel that way when they encounter this artifact, that it is larger than itself, that it continues to speak. It continues to bear witness, even in our time. And so um, once I realized that I had to work on the sack, I tried to see it. But I actually began this project in this uh, interstitial period when the sack was on display nowhere. It had already left Middleton Place and it was uh, still in storage waiting to be exhibited at the Smithsonian. But this period of um, in betweenness, I think, was an important. Uh, incubating period for me because I had the chance to go to Middleton Place and to um, walk the grounds and, and to think about the contrast, which Toni Morrison has so, so beautifully and compellingly laid out in her novel, Beloved. The contrast between the beauty and the horror of places in the South, the, the beauty and the horror of Black life during the period of enslavement. For me, Middleton Place encapsulates all that. It is a gorgeous sight. So gorgeous that one might almost forget why it was actually constructed. Who lived there, what its purpose was. And so uh, in the end, I think I was fortunate to have this moment where I uh, could go to Middleton Place and experience the site before I physically saw the sack. I first saw the sack at um, the Smithsonian and um, had a very powerful experience as many people do, I think, when they confront this object. So here is one of the flanker uh, buildings at Middleton Place. This is the only one that's still standing, I believe. 
there's so many people here who can who can correct me if I get any details wrong. Karen's nodding. And I took this this I didn't take this photo. Excuse me. This is uh, not mine. This is one that I grabbed from own work. But I took a number of photos when I was there, and um, some of them appear in the book and capture a moment in time when I had a chance to experience this place and to think about that contrast. I actually went to Middleton Place uh, during the Easter holiday, which was quite interesting because uh, it, was, it was very busy. It was full of bright colors, you know, the pastels. It was full of joy. There were a number of families there, a number of children there, you know, girls in their Easter dresses, beautiful flowers in bloom. And um, again, the contrast between that scene and the history was um, utterly gripping for me and um, really inspired a good deal of how it was that I ended up trying to frame and trying to narrate the story of the sack and the story of the women who packed the sack, received the sack, saved it, cared for it, and passed it down. So I'm talking a lot about um, this sack, and, and Tracy talked about this sack, so I think it's time for me to say a bit more specifically about it. And what we are all referring to is uh, a bag. It's uh, a cotton bag, it's an antique seed or flower bag that was manufactured in the mid 19th century. And it's an item that might seem on the face of it unworthy of uh, much notice. The very first description of the sack was done by the staff members at Middleton Place. And um, there's a very detailed uh, paragraph that was published in the catalog for the New York exhibit that Tracy Todd mentioned. And I'm going to read a bit of it right now to give you more of a sense of the physical specificity of this sack. Charleston, South Carolina, circa 1850 for the sack, 1921 for the needlework. Plain weave cotton ground, cotton lock stitch fabrication, three strand cotton embroidery floss, back stitch embroidery. Height uh, 29, and, uh, and then some more. Width 15, and a few more inches down. And then to continue from the catalog, sacks made of plain weave cotton, like this example, were manufactured for flower seeds and other food staples beginning in the late 1840s with the invention of the industrial sewing machine. Unlike stitching by hand, the double locking chain stitch produced by the machine made a seam strong enough to hold heavy contents. Numerous worn spots have been reinforced with rectangles of cloth carefully hand sewn in place. Now, this physical object, this material thing that I just described is much more than what it might seem on the surface. It's much more than the details of what it was made of. It's much more than its size, although those end up being very important to trying to interpret and understand the sack. It's much more than its very interesting movements across time and space, because this sack um, really has gotten around. It has been moved by many, many people, touched by many hands. And this is, I think, an intriguing part of the story and um, a very worthwhile reminder of uh, what I think is a fact, reflection of reality, that we need to have um, many hands working together to preserve special items, to preserve history. We need all hands on deck. And many hands have been joined hard at work to try to take care of this sack, to preserve it, and to make it visible to numerous audiences so that it can be engaged with, so that it can be very carefully considered. And so that potentially, hopefully, it can expand people's understanding of the past and also inspire new ways of thinking about the present. This sack, It's like a book of ages, in a sense. I mean, it just opens up. It tells so many stories about um, Black women's lives and slave women's lives, about women's textile and craft work, about uh, the Black family, about Black families, plural. That's just my computer telling me that I need an update. 
that way. Um, and about uh, heirlooms and inheritance and, and what the word inheritance even means about survival, about resilience, and about centrally love. One of the ways that I felt very connected to the, to the sack is a way that perhaps that many of us would feel connected to it. It is a symbol of connection between family members. And um, it brings to mind the ways that many of us give and receive things across the generations. The ways that we pass down heirlooms, the ways that we save things like quilts or recipes or articles of clothing, photographs. But even though we can connect with the sack and connect with its story, the sack actually, I think, jolts us out of our own temporary lives and out of our moment and, um, and out of perhaps a sense of complacency or comfort. Because this sack was packed by a woman who was enslaved, a woman named Rose who had very little control over her own life and who had no financial asset. Oftentimes now when we pass down something, um, we have plenty. We have control over our choices. And yet Rose, the person who found the sack, acquired the sack and packed it, had none of that. She was an unfree, enslaved woman in Charleston in the 1850s, who was about to have her child stolen from her. And uh, in a moment of grave threat, deep terror that we cannot imagine, she grabbed a sack, something that she had access to. She grabbed the very sack that we now know as Ashley's sack, and she started to pack it with a variety of items. I think crucially, very importantly, this sack would not be for Rose herself, but instead it would be for her child, for her daughter Ashley, who was nine years old. When I think about this moment, I imagine Rose thinking on her feet, having no choice but to, to think on her feet, having to act with creativity, but also acting with foresight, sort of looking to the future of what could happen, what might happen, and making a judgment call. I think about how she might have asked herself, what might be required to keep one small girl alive? And I think that Rose's answer to that question is in part evident in the things that she packed that day. And these things included a dress, a braid, pecans, and a mother's love. And in my book, I attempt to tell the story not only of Rose and Ashley and the descendants, but also of the Black women writ large, of Black women's experience in bondage and of Black women's resilience, and of Black women's insistence on love and on care and on family by taking each of these items and opening them up and out. One of the ways that I do that is by bringing in a number of um, adjacent sources, the writings, of, of the interviews, oral histories of other Black women who lived around the same time. So here is a detailed image of the front of Ashley's sack. And this is the key piece of evidence that told me the things that I just told you, that have told other researchers who look at the sack, the things that they know and that we know about the sack. This item itself, this artifact, this bag, this cloth, 
is the evidence. It is our historical record about the lives of these women. This is some of the things that is uh, most compelling about the story. The fact that we almost didn't know about it. The story really was on the verge of being lost because it was never kept in any archive. Black women's stories, indigenous women's stories, marginalized people's stories were not thought of as being important enough to be recorded from their perspective. We know of this act because it was cherished by a single line of black women, because it was a lifeline connecting a mother and a daughter, a lifeline across a lineage, a, a lifeline in what I often like to think of as the House of Rose. We hear a lot about the House of Windsor these days, right? I think of this as the House of Rose. We know about this act because Ruth Middleton embroidered the story on the artifact itself. Ruth Middleton was a descendant. Rose, she tells us here on the object that she was the granddaughter of Ashley. She was born in South Carolina and then moved to Philadelphia in the first wave of the Great Migration. And in her early years there, she embroidered this sack with her family of stone. I'm going to read it aloud. And uh, I think you will hear the oral quality that exists in this incredible artifact, this incredible record, this incredible story, which is also a speech act. Ruth sewed, my great-grandmother Rose, mother of Ashley, gave her this back when she was sold at age nine in South Carolina. It held a tattered dress, three handfuls of pecans, a braid of Rose's hair. Told her, would be filled with my love always. She never saw her again. Ashley is my grandmother. Ruth Middleton, 1920. The embroidered story of forced separation and loss on this sack is so common in the history of American slavery. And yet it is breathtakingly particular to this mother and to this daughter. This story tells us not only that they survived and that Black women survived because otherwise many of us who are in this virtual space right now would not be here. It tells us not only that they survived the atrocity of captivity, but also how. It also tells us how black women survive. And I think what we can really glean here is that black women made it, not all of them, as we know, but many of them made it. You're identifying the physical and emotional needs of their children and their family members, identifying what is required to keep a small girl alive. And then by generously and lovingly providing those essential things to the best of their ability, they can do with what they had. They can do with what they could get their hands on. They can do with what their imaginations and their emotions could view with staying power. And we can see here in the example 
of Ashley Sack that some of those essential items, those essential elements that were necessary for survival, speak not only to the lives of Black women and Black girls and Black children and families, but also to the lives of all human beings. The story is specific, and the story is also broad and big and capacious. It tells us what it takes to live and to love in the darkest and most dire and most threatening of circumstances. This act tells us that Black women, like Rose, focused on food. Yes, of course, that human hierarchy of needs. They focused on clothing. They also focused on shelter. Now here you might think that I'm stretching a little bit. Let me tell you what I was thinking here. And in the book, I tried to expand on this idea. I tried to speculate about how this sack could be a shelter. This is where some of those details about the sack's physical characteristics actually come into play. This was not a small sack. This was a big sack. This was quite a long item that Rose gave to Ashley. This was a bag that was big enough to serve as a blanket, maybe to serve as a covering, for protection from the weather and, and the elements, even big enough perhaps for a very small girl to crawl into, to sleep inside of. So to me, this sack also represents a gift of shelter. I think the sack represents identity, as encapsulated by, represented by uh, a sense of lineage. And to my mind, it is the braid of Rose's hair that captures this idea most saliently. Because the braid connected Ashley to Rose, it was the link, it was the line to her mother. And hair connects us to our families and it connects us to all of humanity. This last idea is one that I borrowed from the very generous textile artist, Sonia Clark, who works with hair as one of her uh, main artistic materials. And he was very generous in talking with me about hair and talking about how um, if we were to take a strand of any, anybody's hair <laughs> in, in this Zoom meeting, we would be able to find the connective threads to all of humanity because hair carries our DNA. And dig all the way down to the bottom, all the way down, we're all one human family. And I think that the story of the sack, this inscription, the items that were packed also tell us that Black women strove to provide the essential thing, the very essential thing of affirmation. And to me, this is what love is opening for us. Love opens the door to affirmation. It opens the door to a recognition, to an emphasis on the fact that no matter where Ashley was, no matter how alone she may have felt, that she was worthy of love and that she belonged not to the people who claimed to own her, but rather to her mother, to her family. She belonged in the embrace represented by that big word, love, that roots dish onto the sound.
So this bag was no ordinary object. It was instead a prescription for survival and evidence of emergency planning in the face of disaster. In the material culture of Black America, this item is one of a kind. And in the current moment of national crisis, I think and I hope that it can perhaps be a model and an inspiration of how it is that we must face the future with a willingness to act, a willingness to plan, a willingness to face down emergency, a willingness to step into the breach that is division and to create threads of connection. Rose's hope for her daughter's perseverance was realized. Her vision for Ashley came to pass. Ashley persisted, as did her daughter, and her daughter, and hers. And in the book, I try to open up many of the themes that I have just shared with you. And I, I try to underscore that the seemingly simple object, the seemingly modest act, um, are actually very complex things, very layered things, and very big actions, very bold, very courageous actions. I emphasize in the book that Rose's act of assembling items and packing Ashley's act of carrying the sack, preserving it, using it, handing it down. Ruth's act of recording the story, the Ruth thread. But all of this is our evidence of familial love and of perseverance against the odds. And it also talked in the book about how the story of the sack is about the personal pain and the collective price that is paid when a society devalues what is precious. It's obvious what that is, right? Ashley's life was precious. Rose's life was precious. Life is precious. And our society, our country, this about all of that. This sack is our reminder. It's like a memory stone. It's like a token of remembrance of that feeling. But I think that it is also inspiration because it tells us that even in these circumstances of grave emergency, looming threat, courageous, creative people cared for one another and they survived. So I see that it's 713 and I think I've only gotten through half of my slides. I haven't even gotten to the example of the dress because I got carried away. I, I do that almost every time when I read the inscription, I just start talking because it is so moving. But I hope that even though I didn't get a chance to read to you an excerpt from the forthcoming book, that you will feel that you have heard enough to spend some time with the optics, spend some time with the story whether it's by way of my book or by way of articles that have been published about the SAC or by way of exhibits that will be showing the SAC. I really do hope that if enough of us see that item, this object, we'll be able to rethink our past as well as our present and future.
So I am going to just stop right here. And if anybody would like to ask a question about what I was going to read about the tattered dress, I'd be happy to address that. Thanks you all so much for your attention. So I, I think we're gonna um, open it up to questions now uh, from the audience. But before that, we're gonna pass the floor to uh, Dr. Bernard Powers and he's gonna open us up with a question for, for Dr. Miles. Sure. Thank, thank you, Joshua. And thank you, Dr. Miles for this fantastic and insightful and very moving presentation. And I want to perhaps uh, begin with with, with this, this question um, that, that I think you are uniquely uh, positioned to, to answer based on your research and your experience. Uh, people bring different expectations, fears, apprehensions, goals when they come to historic sites, when they come to house museums, when they come to plantations and uh, you, 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 your reference to the, the sack is so apt because uh, that sack contained the, the apprehensions, the fears of, of Ashley, of, of Rose, but also the instruments and the material out of which survival could be fashioned. So my, 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 my question is really this. What is it that people ought to take away from their visits to historic sites like Middleton Place, Drayton Hall, the house museums in, in Savannah that you're so familiar with? Uh, what should they what should they take away, particularly with regard to understanding more about what you call the interior zone of enslaved people? Because it's so difficult often for for people to move beyond the story of abuse and persecution and pain. And that interior zone is so terribly important. So if you could talk more about that. Thank you for that question. That was a very interesting and compelling question. I think that I want to start with the sack. I love starting with the sack. Um, and then make my way toward what your question focused on, which was historic sites. One of the things that is so wonderful about this object is its multifaceted nature. And as you said in, in phrasing the question, this object was many things at once. It was the bag itself. It was the things inside of the bag. Some of the things inside of the bag were themselves multiples of other things. So the pecans were many pecans. The braid would have been three strands of hair. The dress was made of many threads. And then on top of that, we have the layers of history, the layers of, of space represented by the sack. We have the many women named and unnamed who would have related to the sack. We have, um, the people who may have actually been able to, to take part and to share in what it is that Ashley had in this act. Maybe she shared her pecans. There are the many people who participated in preserving this act and in viewing this act. And I start here to say that this single item should symbolize for us just how multifaceted, just how diverse, just how complex these histories are. 
And then on top of the complexity of the history and the multiplicity of the history, we have, we have exactly as you have said, the many individual people who go to these historic sites, perhaps they're going to um, a restored uh, plantation site, perhaps they're going to a museum and they bring themselves with them, right? We always bring ourselves with us. They bring their memories, they bring their identities, they bring their expectations, as you've said, they bring their desires. And um, I'm saying they, I should be saying we, we all do this. So there are um, many other additional layers of complexity that enter in when we get individuals and people interacting with objects and spaces that represent enslavement, that represent the past. One of the things that this means, I think, is that we would do well to be patient with one another. Be patient because we have to recognize that it takes time, it takes thought, it takes consideration, it takes relationship, it, it takes talking, it takes quiet contemplation to be able to make sense of, synthesize, manage all of that complexity. <laughs> no one's gonna get it the first time around. I certainly haven't gotten it and I've been working on this project for many, many years. So that's the first thing that I wanna say in response to your question. These are not easy topics. These are not um, easy issues. These are not easy sites. But I think we need to have a little bit of grace with one another. There's one thing I think the SAC represents at its heart. It's that word love. It's that sense of grace and care. Having said that, now I, I must say that one of the big problems and challenges, especially with um, plantations and urban manor homes that are restored and beautiful, um, is that they can give the impression that we are talking about an idealized past, you know, kind of a, a Jane Austen movie past. Mm -hmm. And we're not, we're talking about an ugly, exploitative past that took many lives and damaged many lives. And so I think it's really important. On top of that notion of patience because of the complexity and grace because we're all human, for people who enter these spaces to reframe how it is they're thinking, to reorient themselves, it is hard to do. It is hard. But these are actually spaces of terror and torture. I'm talking now about the plantations and I'm talking about um, farms. I'm talking about urban manor homes where people were enslaved, not specifically about museums right now. These are spaces of exploitation and terror and horror. These are traumatic spaces for many people. These are spaces of mourning and they can be spaces of commemoration, but I don't think they should be spaces of celebration and frivolity, with perhaps one exception. And the one exception would be if descendants of enslaved people choose to come together and to return to a space which I, which I know has happened at Middleton Place and, and other places, and they want to reclaim that space and remember their ancestors, then good. That is an, is an important means of engagement. But, you know, frankly, that's the only scenario when I can uh, imagine it being a good thing for people to be dancing on plantation grounds. So we have time for about one more question because Dr. Miles has a our stop at 7.30. So we're going to 
go over to the audience and Dr. Tindall asks, in many ways, Ashley Sack symbolizes the intimacies and interiority of Black women's lives within the histories of enslavement and the reemergence of racialized terror in the 1920s. Uh, your work rescues this intergenerational narrative about Black women from historical erasure. How do we ensure Black women are not lost in the margins of history and archives? Are there specific strategies one might employ to ask questions about Black women's material culture? You got about three minutes to answer that, so good luck. <laughs> I know I've been going on and on uh, rather long. And Joshua, I thank you for coming in when you did, because I was about to go into a whole other a set of responses about the museum space. <laughs> but I love this question about um, Black women and the archives and the historical record and what we can do. Um, first of all, we can open our eyes and our ears, you know, use, use our senses, use um, everything that we've got to identify the ways in which Black women are speaking to us from the past that we may have overlooked. Historical work tends to be uh, rigidly focused on a hunt for documents, a hunt for the paper trail and for the paper record. But not everybody was producing documents. Many people were not even permitted to learn how to read, to learn how to write, didn't have the legal standing to produce the documents that end up in uh, the state archives, for instance. So once we loosen our sense of adherence and strict um, fealty to documents, we see so many more possibilities for how we can uh, hear about Black women's experience and glimpse their interior worlds. I do stress though that we, we are still only glimpsing because we were not there and we are not these people of whom we speak. We still are trying to access this history through the distance of time. And uh, we can never fully recapture that. But we can come closer if we think about things like this sack, if we think about uh, food, food items, if we think about buildings. Somebody put into the chat um, a comment about who built all of these places. So we can find Black women in the things that they made in the spaces where they lived, on the streets where they walked. And I also think that we can be actively engaged in recovery projects. As Tracy mentioned at the beginning of our conversation tonight, um, this sack was found at a flea market in a rag bin by just a regular shopper who, thank heavens, read it and realized that this was something really important and then decided that uh, rather than um, trying to sell it at a high price, that she would donate it to Middleton Place. We can pay attention to spaces where we might come across potential sources, and then we can try to save those sources, and we can try to give them to a museum, give them to a library, give them to places that will have the means and the know-how for protecting them. And, um, I know that I only have three minutes, Joshua. I think I'm actually, I think I'm doing okay with my three minutes. Uh, and, and we can also, thumbs up from Karen, we can also remember that we are living right now in someone else's past. Our present is gonna be the past of our descendants. I think this, this probably really, um, became obvious and clear um, during the pandemic, which of course we are still suffering through, although there is, it seems a light toward the end of that tunnel. But I think it became clear that this, this is an important moment that we're living in. We're living in historical times. They're all historical times. Sometimes we notice more than others. And we can be actually creating the records right now on Black women's history. If you are a Black woman in this, in this Zoom space and you're keeping a diary, guess what? Maybe one day in the future, a researcher will look to your words as a way to try to begin to gain access to this moment, as a way to try to understand the interior experience 
of black women in this moment. And uh, that's the same for, for any of us, and especially for people who are in groups that have been marginalized in the historical record. We can keep our own records now. And we can, of course, and we must tell our stories. We must tell our stories. Wow, Dr. Miles, I wish, really wish we had more time to, to really dig in and talk more about this amazing work. Something that you mentioned um, in your book, I think of the, something of the, of the words that we are ancestors descendant. Or, or, or yeah, something of that. And I'm like, that's just such a great way to, to think about us living in the present right now, but we are somebody's ancestors. You know, yes, we are. But it's 729. I just want to lift up in the chat. Um, there is a link uh, that Karen dropped to uh, if you wanted to purchase the book now. But uh, for future references, they will be sold at uh, Middleton Place uh, and the International African American Museum. And I just wanted to hand it over to Tracy to uh, uh, close us up. Thank you, Joshua. And I just wanted to send a shout out to our friend uh, Brenda Tyndall, who's on who's online and up at, uh, up at the Peabody Museum. Um, great uh, to have that constituency with us uh, tonight and have Brenda's friendship um, as she left Charleston, but we'll hopefully be able to keep in touch with her. Um, thank you, Dr. Powers, as always, my historical hero. Um, good, to, good to be back with you again. Uh, Joshua and Karen and, um, and, uh, and Dr. Miles just, um, thank you so much. Uh, we are looking forward to uh, getting our hands on more copies of the book and getting it on our shelves. So if everyone could give us a little patience and grace, uh, we do have them on the way uh, and we will have them uh, online on our website and uh, on our online store and in the museum shop. And uh, thank you again. Um, uh, it's been a, been a real pleasure. Thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure and I can't wait to come back to Charleston in person. Very good. Well, good night, everyone. Bye, everyone. Take care. Good night. Thank you so very much. Thanks for your comments in the chat, everybody. We're seeing them. <laughs>